Now this week I want us to think about, I've entitled it Why Mission, but I don't think that's quite right. Um, I, I actually think the title is more like City Life Global or City Life on Mission, because Why Missions is very obvious. Have you picked up the difference in, in church life between mission and missions? If you add the yes, it's very important. <laughs> so mission is what we're all about, and that is Jesus told us to make disciples, and we're all called to make disciples. If you think you can outsource that to a pastor, an evangelist, or a missionary, then think again, because you cannot outsource your responsibility for making disciples. That can't be done. Jesus is talking to you. The Holy Spirit's leading you. He wants you to actually engage in reaching your friends and the people around you. So none of us escape that. And then there's an extension into missions. Uh, it was a mission or missions. Missionary is a sent one. And so the missions is all about then taking that message further afield, usually cross-culturally. So learning another language, learning another culture, uh, engaging with that worldwide evangelization. So that's the importance of the S on the word mission is it becomes missions and then away you go. But we call it City Life Global and we just want to get the idea that we're all on mission but we've sent people and we partner with people around the world. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of the nations. And uh, that's just a very simple instruction that the nations or the ethnos, the ethnic groups of the world are the targets of God's love and grace. And he wants us to be engaged in that process. Uh, there's a um, Joshua Project, which some years ago identified about 16,000 ethnic groups around the world that were in need of outreach, need of a message of the gospel. That's down to around about 9,000 now. Uh, so thousands of people groups, ethnic groups, different languages, different cultures that need the gospel, need somebody to come, live among them, learn the language, engage with the process so they can hear the gospel. And this has been the calling of the church for 2,000 years and it hasn't changed. It remains the same. So we want to take our part in that. Now I have jumped ahead, but let's get, Mark, get that first image up. These are the projects. So this is Project 23 and we're having offering today. If you want to give online, you can go to our website and do all that. You can give in the silver box. Just put it Project 23. What this is, is our churches in Australia, Australian Christian churches, the group we belong to, about a 1,000 churches or so, we come together once a year to engage projects of our field workers. And you can go, if you want, some of these are tax deductible, if that's important to you, you can go to ACCI, to the website, and you can give directly to these or other projects. You can go through, there's a whole bunch of them, and you can pick whatever you like, and you can give to that. And we just want to make that a focus. What it does is it allows our field workers to engage in expansion projects and start initiatives and support what they're doing. So we've chosen three of them that we're going to get involved with. Uh, what, two of them represent uh, what is a gradual move for us into more community development work in Cambodia. So we've been involved in community development work around the world, uh, in Thailand, in Japan, and particularly in Vietnam, uh, with a partnership with local communities. Now that's changing and transforming. And we've been doing that for years, but we sense that God is leading us in a slightly different direction. And a part of that is work in Cambodia. So as you know, we've got our uh, workers, uh, Andrew and Maya, in Cambodia, uh, working among the young professionals. I'll talk about that in a minute. But there's another aspect of critical work in Cambodia, and that's community transformation, uh, particularly in the rural areas. It's a largely rural population, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. And we have uh, two uh, friends that are working in community transformation, actually three, uh, in Cambodia. Now, we haven't quite got the direction that we feel is for us for the next few years, but we're wanting, the scripture says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put some treasure into the field. And we're going to say, God, you lead us now uh, to where you want us to go together. 
And so we've chosen these three. I'll leave that one. But these two here are both in Cambodia. Strong Village um, is actually conducted by one of our sister churches in the Hawkesbury. And they're called Strong Nation Church. And they have uh, workers in just north of Phnom Penh. Uh, in a play, and they call it Strong Village. And what they've done, if you, you can read that for yourself on the website, there's an area there that they're working in where there's something like how many? It was 20 or 40 households. Do you remember how many? Um, and they literally don't have access to a toilet facility of any kind in the homes, in the, anywhere. So uh, in consultation with the community, what they've decided to do is that they would actually build a communal toilet block, a bathroom block for the community. And so that's that project. And so we're going to give, we're probably $1,000 or something will go to that. If you want to give more to that, go for your life. Uh, we believe in that kind of community development where our workers partner with the local community to see if they can get something done to move the thing forward. And that's all about health and well-being, obviously. This one here, which is, is a lot of fun, Ben and Tita Prevo, um, come from the Hawkesbury as well. And uh, they've been working in Cambodia for many years. Uh, ben was the youth pastor of one of the churches in the Hawkesbury. And uh, they moved many years ago back there. Tita comes from there. Um, and they're working, again, just north of Phnom Penh. This, this is an example of a youth bus. It looks like a youth bus, doesn't it? But anyway, for those who you, you're probably aware, um, vehicles in Cambodia are very expensive. Uh, there's a lot of import duty and a whole bunch of reasons for that. But basically, vehicles there will cost almost double what they'll cost here. Um, so it's a ridiculous situation, but that's the way it is. And you remember that last year, well, I think it was, or earlier this year, we were involved with fundraising to help Andrew and Mayer upgrade their vehicle. And uh, they've done that, and it's made a massive difference to their daily life, which we're really grateful for. So what they're doing, though, is they're, they've been dragging a whole bunch of young people around in the back of their ute, um, which is, you know, incredibly safe and secure. Um, not. Um, and what they've got now is a project so they get one of these. These things, uh, I know what they're called in China, but I don't know what they're called in Indonesia. But they're, a, they're, they're basically a local bus. So people will jump on and tie their sow cows or something. Anyway, um, they, they basically jump on the back of that and go around. This is like their local bus. And so they're going to buy one of those in order to facilitate their youth program. Anybody think that's a good idea? I, I think that's a good idea. And so we're going to put our treasure into this field because we know this is where God's leading us as a group. And so we're going to put some treasure in there. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that we could be doing. But at the moment, we're just going to do that and see where God takes us. This one here is uh, our long-term partners in Vietnam. Um, and uh, so we're going to engage with a new program that they're doing. Uh, they have been working with the uh, Communist Party and local communities. They, they literally are never allowed to preach the gospel. But what they do is they do so much community welfare work uh, that the, the government can't ignore them. And for those who know the history of Vietnam, there's, I think there's now three uh, churches that are registered in Vietnam. One of those is AOG. And one of the main reasons for that is that there's a group called AOG World Relief who run this program, who run a whole lot of programs of development. And the government recognised that they were connected to the local underground AOG and a few years back, after a long, long process, actually recognised that church group because of the community work that was being done. So these guys have been incredibly smart over about 25 years. They partnered with the local churches and with the local community in order to build a platform for the church to move forward in Vietnam. Very clever, uh, very wise, never been able to preach the gospel. But the churches are moving forward because a foundation has been built. Their next project, um, they're doing, actually there's another one they do with, uh, is a milk program. Remember, who's old enough to have had milk at school? You remember, you just thought that assembly would just go so long and that milk was getting warmer and warmer, wasn't it? Who remembers the milk getting warmer and warmer? Yeah, you young people don't know how much we suffered before you. And then you'd have the milk. Well, 
they're actually doing that same program in a couple of areas uh, in the Da Nang area in the middle of Vietnam uh, because there's the people are nutrient poor. And so they're actually financing milk distribution uh, in amongst the families. So they do, all, they do a lot of stuff. They do heart operations. They do livestock for families. I mean, you name it, these guys do it. But, but their latest one is this one, which is about child advocacy. And uh, many of you wouldn't know, but we, some, one, one of the big issues, I'll get to that in a minute, but one of the big issues in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia uh, generally is child drowning. Um, so they don't know how to swim, they get caught, uh, and one kid dies, and then the friend goes in to get them, they both die. Um, so these guys have been doing a lot of training on uh, all areas of child welfare. We've had teams go over there and do training on uh, water safety, and we've sponsored in one area where we're partnering with a, a village, a group of villages in an area, to actually build a swimming pool uh, and sponsor swimming trainers. And so this is the kind of thing that these guys do and that we've partnered with over the years. And so this one, though, is directly about uh, child advocacy for child safety um, and in the obvious areas. And so this is a critical one, and, and it's a new one for them, so we want to invest in that. So that's the three that we've chosen to do corporately, to do together. As I said, go on the website. If there's something else that you really think is great, then jump into that. Uh, but we'll, we'll give to some of these things, and we'll let you know as we go. So your Project 23 giving, if you do it on the website, just put Project 23. Um, if you do it in the silver box, just identify Project 23. That's what we'll be doing uh, with this year's round of this giving. Is that good? It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Okay, let me talk to you now about our response to Jesus' call to the nations. So we know that we're called to the nations, but how are we going to do that as a group of people? Um, every one of us has got, oh, most, many of us have got contacts in the world of missions. Um, the best man from my wedding uh, was the, uh, the overseer of YWAM in the Middle East. Lived in Jordan uh, for many, many years. Um, but as a group, as a church, we never supported what they were doing. We love what they're doing, but it wasn't what we were called to do. I've got uh, good friends now that are in Turkey. You might see that Turkey's in the news this morning in relation to the Middle East crisis. And I have good friends who are right in the middle of Turkey uh, who are currently replanting churches. You know that uh, Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey. It was the seat and heart of the first century church. But it's been overtaken by Muslim, uh, Ottoman Empire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and these guys are now back in Turkey planting, replanting the church in that nation. Uh, we're not supporting them as a church, uh, but we love what they're doing. I could go on and I could list, uh, there's a beautiful couple in Lesotho in South Africa, uh, Southern Africa, um, who are doing, uh, they've gone into a community where there were hundreds of street children. And through God's movement in what they're doing, there are now no street children in that community as God's led them in a process of bringing children off the street into school. They actually run a school now and get them back into families. Amazing, amazing people doing an amazing work. And God hasn't led us to partner with them. Okay, so I want, to, I want you to understand that what we do is we're very seriously saying God, what is it that you want us to do together in the world of missions? Because there's so much stuff that we could be involved with. And I'm supporting, I know there's people here engaged with stuff in India. India is one of the greatest, most needful nations on earth as far as unreached people are concerned. And the need for the church to move out from the Christian areas to the non-Christian areas. And we know that, but God's never led us to be involved together in that. We've focused and said, God, what do you want us to do? In uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, Paul gets this dream. A man from Macedonia calls out to him. And after the blockages the Holy Spirit's put in his way, he gets this dream about Macedonia. And it says, we concluded that's where we were supposed to go. I don't know that took a lot of intelligence to conclude that. They weren't allowed to go anywhere else. And then he has a dream about Macedonia. That's pretty obvious to anybody, really. And so off they went to Macedonia. 
We're trying to do the same thing and seek God and say, okay, as a church, what is it that we're supposed to do in the world? We've had a long-term engagement with Thailand, which came to an end a few years ago, but we've had a legacy contact with uh, Tony and Ed Higgs that we now support in field ministry support, as we do the Hiltons who were in Vietnam and, again, have been a long-term connection for us. And so we're saying, God, what do you want us to do? Two of those fields are very important to us. The first one is China. China. And for many, many years, we've been supporting work in China, church planting work, microenterprise, uh, all kinds of church planting approaches, cross-cultural ministry training, all kinds of stuff in China. As you know, the people we saw on the screen uh, recently are from, well, he's from here. Uh, she's actually Tibetan. And uh, we've supported them uh, since they've gone to the work in China. If I can have that map up, please, Mark. Here we have China. And uh, what I've got that up there for is they are actually the minority groups of China. I think it's 54 or something that the government recognises, but there's heaps more. So China's a complex nation. It's predominantly Han Chinese, which is all this mob, and that's where all the population is. And the great Chinese revivals occurred in this area here, all around there and somewhat up here. Um, this province particularly. And uh, so hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people getting saved in those rural provinces. Uh, and that's the great Chinese revival starting around about the 80s and, and, and through from there. Now, what's happened since then is there's been a massive migration from the rural areas into the cities, particularly towards the east, Beijing, Shanghai, down into Fujian, all those areas that you can look up for yourself. And about 500, get this in your head, about 500 million people moved from the rural areas into the cities. That, that's mind-boggling, isn't it? Mind-boggling. As a result, there are a whole bunch of immigrant churches in the city, countryside people coming to the city, planting churches. But at the same time, the Chinese community and culture, the people have got more and more wealthy, the middle class. There's more middle class people in China now than there are in the United States. They've got more money. And that has changed the, the mission field in China dramatically. And one of the things that we've been partnering with is urban church planting. Some of you would remember Every Nation, Steve Zhao and our friends that have done that and been part of church planting in Shanghai, Beijing, Xi'an, down into Hong Kong and a whole bunch of other places and the partnership we've had with them. One of the teams, a few of the teams that we were taking into China were doing the uh, street outreach in those cities uh, supporting that work of urban church planting because the percentage of Christians in those big cities is much lower than in the rural areas. So that's a big need in China. The other big need in China that, we've, that God's led us to is the minority, minority areas. So these groups, they, all these coloured things, they're all minority people. Don't worry about the size of this. This is kind of like Australia. Massive areas and hardly any people. Uh, so you would be familiar with the Uyghur uh, who are up here. That's the m big Muslim group. They m live mainly over here on the border. And, uh, and there's Christian work in amongst the Uyghur people. Not a lot of it, but there is a bit of it. Um, and this Tibetan area, of course, is, is a really major area of outreach. And our friend in China at the moment is of Tibetan origin. One of the things they're exploring is how can God open up work into the minority areas. These minority tribes and groups, and there's masses of them down here. Um, this one here, for example, there's one... They, they, they're animist, all that sort of stuff. There's millions of them who've never heard the gospel. If you want to go as a missionary today in the world, uh, can I encourage you to think about going down here uh, where you can be so close to Hong Kong, you can go anywhere in the world you like, but nobody's heard the gospel. Isn't that madness? Don't you think that's madness? This is why people say in regard to missions, why should anybody hear the gospel twice when people haven't heard it once? That's why they say that, because here we have these churches in Hong Kong that are really large, large churches. We have this massive rural church in China, and yet we've got these groups of people who have yet to hear the gospel. It's madness. But that's typical of world missions. So the two things in China that we are focused on is urban outreach 
and unreached minorities. We want to we want to be engaged in those two things in some way. And God has spoken to us about that over and over. I remember the first time I was in Beijing with a group of underground pastors and that was the first time God really spoke to me about our engagement. I remember in Thailand where God spoke to me about the Thai Muslims and how we're supposed to be engaged with that. I remember when people came back from Vietnam the first time and God spoke to us about engagement there. I remember you get the drift. In each of these places, God has spoken and said to us, this is something you need to do together. If we uh, come to, we don't have a picture. If we come to Cambodia, which is the other major one, there's a lost generation. Those you need to look up. I realised talking to some of our young people who had no idea who Pol Pot was and what the Khmer Rouge was and what happened way back then, which wasn't that far way back uh, because there's guys who are my age who lived through that guys who are my age who are no longer alive because they were killed in that revolution. So uh, it's not that far back. Um, And there's a lost generation in Cambodia. And two needs in Cambodia that are really critical. The first one is the wealthy and young professionals. Uh, The percentage of Christians so-called in Cambodia is maybe about one and a half, but they're very nominal. The genuine born-again believers in Cambodia is probably about 0.4% of the population, less than half percent of the population. If you take that to young, up-and-coming, young professionals, people at university, et cetera, et cetera, it goes down to about zero. So when our team goes there and we start to go out into the tea houses and the coffee shops and stuff like that, the people that we will meet will not have heard of Jesus, will not have heard the gospel Uh, Many of them won't even know what a Christian is. Uh, That's the environment that you go into. And so Andrew and May are obviously planting in amongst that group of people, seeking to reach out into that. The second need is what we talked about. That's the rural development. And so we'll look at those. So there's our corporate challenge, if you like, for us as a church. This is what we're focused on in the world of missions. Now, I want to just tell, I want to just look at two stories The second component of what we do to respond to that is a philosophy of partnership. We're not interested in doing something on our own. I've encountered many pastors over the years who want to go to a particular country in the world and they want to preach their latest message series. Because when God spoke to them about, you know, the book of Ezekiel uh, in speaking with the people of Sydney, then clearly that's a message that the whole church in the whole world needs to hear. That's not the case, just by the way. Uh, God's, very, God's very aware of doing something locally and contextually, which we don't have a great grasp of. And so we're not interested in that kind of mission work where, you know, the, you know, the white saviour comes in with the great message and all the rest of that nonsense that goes on. We're interested in partnership partnership. We want people on the field who understand the culture, speak the language that we can partner with so we can encourage them and do the work that God's called us to. Let me just read these couple of stories to you. And uh, you're getting to know that when we get on the missions, I just rave. So sorry about that, but that's the way it is. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Just some thoughts around partnership. What did you say? Uh, shake that bush. Exactly right. Um, Luke 5, verses 1 to 11. Here we go. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Uh, Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, We toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. I don't know how you take that. Maybe he was humble and and he thought, Jesus knows what he's doing. The carpenter is now going to tell us how to go fishing. Uh, I don't know. I think it might have been a little bit of frustration there, but we'll see. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And here's the bit I want us to get. They signaled to their partners in the other boat, to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so they began to sink. He goes on to say that he was going to teach them to be fishers of men. Do you think it's any accident that it was Peter, 
probably Andrew, James and John, who came and helped. And they, they were one of the first apostles that Jesus called. Do you think it's any accident that Jesus did a miracle to demonstrate to them, you're going to need each other to bring this harvest in? Do you think that's an accident? Or do you think that Jesus knows what he's doing? I think the latter. And what we learn, you learn a lot from that, but what I learned from this and so many other passages in the scriptures is that world mission, world engagement, and our mission here locally is all about partnership. It's all about partnership. Who is it that we are called to work together with in our own cell groups, in our own community, in the communities of the world? How are we developing those partnerships? One of the reasons why we travel to those parts of the world regularly with teams and individually is we want to develop those relationships and make sure they're strong so that we can partner together in what God has called us to. And then my last little reading from the scripture is Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, we see uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. We see Jesus praying. I don't need to read it probably. Matthew 26, Jesus is troubled and he goes off to pray. He says to the guys, Peter and John in particular, he says, can you pray with me? Can you pray with me? And what happens? They go to sleep. Jesus comes back, and this is the phrase that sticks with me. He says, could you not wait with me one hour? Here we come to the point of Jesus giving his life for the mission. In the, in the, in the world of missions, there's the story of bacon and eggs. Anybody know the story of bacon and eggs? The pig and the chicken. So the pig and the chicken have a chat and they say, I think we should make breakfast for the farmer. And the chicken says, that's a great idea. And then the pig says, I'm not so keen. Bacon and eggs. The point is, Jesus said to these guys, I'm about to die. He didn't tell them that, but I'm about to die. Could you not wait with me for an hour? Could you not sacrifice something to engage what we're about. And when I look at the world of missions and our response, those two things are really critical to me. What partnership have we got? What partnership is God leading us to as a group? When I come to the offerings, my faith promises, my project offerings, whatever, when I come to those offerings, I understand that's our partners. And secondly, what am I prepared to sacrifice? to move that ball forward. Because if I'm not prepared to sacrifice, then I believe I dishonor my partner. That's what I believe. They have sacrificed, many of them, everything to serve God and to get amongst the mission he's called them to. If I'm not prepared to sacrifice, I'm probably the chicken, not the pig. And I need to think about what I'm doing. So those two things, partnership, and sacrifice. We put those together in the areas of the world that God has called us to.